Good evening and uh, welcome. My name is Malik Stewart and I'm the Director of Multicultural Student Services at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Thank you for joining us this evening as we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'd like to take a moment to thank members of the MLK Planning Committee for their time, inspiration, and work in helping to plan this year's events. While the realities of COVID-19 forced us to change some of our plans, uh, we're blessed to have technology that allows us to gather safely in this virtual environment as we recommit to the fight for justice and equality, both at home and abroad. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land we sit on today. Both the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University occupy the original homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. We honor, respect, and acknowledge the indigenous peoples forcibly removed from this territory whose connection remains today. St. Benedict's Monastery and St. John's Abbey previously operated boarding schools for native children. Now, students, faculty, and staff are working to repair relationships with our native nation neighbors. The theme for uh, this year's MLK Week at St. Ben's and St. John's is the fierce urgency of now, a phrase Dr. King used in two prominent speeches, one being his well-known I Have a Dream speech, and the other in his Beyond Vietnam sermon of April 1967, given at Riverside Church in New York City. Quoting from his Beyond Vietnam sermon, Dr. King said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There's an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. Powerful words spoken 55 years ago uh, and just as relevant today. I hope you keep those words uh, and that phrase, the fierce urgency of mind, uh, the fierce urgency of now in mind um, as we go through tonight's event. So I'm honored uh, tonight uh, to welcome Dr. Christopher Lehman to our community for our keynote event of this year's MLK Week. Dr. Lehman attended the University of Oklahoma for his undergraduate degree and earned his PhD in African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts at, at Amherst. He is a professor of ethnic studies at St. Cloud State University, a former summer visiting fellow at Harvard University, and the author of six books on African American history and culture. His most recent work being Slavery's Reach, Southern Slaveholders in the North Star State. I've had the fortune to read Slavery's Reach uh, with a group of uh, Bennies and Johnnies and fellow St. Ben's and St. John's community members. And it's been both enlightening and challenging. Um, and I have to say, uh, I'm really excited for tonight's event. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Christopher Lehman. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I'd also like to thank the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University for this great honor of giving the King keynote address. I appreciate this opportunity very much. I would also at this point like to acknowledge that we Minnesotans are on land where indigenous nations have once resided and communed. My book, Slavery's Reach, tells part of the story of what happened to that land after the United States acquired it by deceit and violence. The country sold the land to other people, and my book talks specifically about slaveholders who purchased that land, this land, Minnesota. Considering that the man we gather to remember today spent his life speaking out against poverty and inequity and the violence accompanying both, the subject of these land sales in Minnesota to enslavers is a most appropriate topic for this evening. After people die, they are no longer able to explain the meanings or contexts of what they said. Sometimes powerful public figures such as government officials, 
quote a deceased person's words outside of their contexts. And then those figures provide an explanation that runs counter to how the deceased person had lived. Unfortunately, supporters or followers of those public figures may accept that explanation because of the authority commanded by the public figures' positions. For almost 54 years, that has been the fate for the words of the man whose life the nation honored through last Monday's holiday. 35 words in particular, all in the same one sentence, suffer this cruel fate. In 1963, at the March on Washington, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that one sentence towards the end of his 15 minute critique of American segregation. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Nearly 60 years later, in 2021, many public officials cited this one sentence in order to criticize the teaching of how systemic slavery and segregation harmed African Americans, also known as critical race theory. For example, a US Senate candidate from Ohio named Josh Mandel said, what the liberals are doing by advancing the cause of critical race theory, they're stopping on the grave of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King once said that he had a dream that his grandkids would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But what you have going on in the government schools by these liberals and the media, by the secular left, by the radical left, they're trying to make everything about skin color. To people like Mandel, Dr. King supposedly would not want us to pay attention to skin color inequity, but rather only to the character of individuals, regardless of their color, because he supposedly did not see color. And Dr. King, who has been deceased since 1968, could not challenge Mandel's interpretation of that one sentence. For example, King was not alive to remind Mandel that the dream about character was for Dr. King's kids, not his grandkids. But do not be fooled by interpretations like Mandel's. During Dr. King's lifetime, he was very well aware of both skin color differences and the history of American injustice stemming from those differences. And he talked about skin color and American history too. In 1957, early in his activism, he said of the slave trade, you remember it started in America in 1619. This is not Nicole Hannah Jones of the 1619 Project saying this in 2022. Again, this is Dr. King in 1957. Dr. King continued, there was a big scramble for power in Africa. With the growth of the slave trade, there came into Africa, into the Gold Coast in particular, not only the Portuguese, but also the Swedes and the Danes and the Dutch and the British. And all of these nations competed with each other to win the power of the Gold Coast so that they could exploit these people for commercial reasons and sell them into slavery. Through the 1960s, Dr. King kept talking about slavery. In 1960, he said that the students conducting sit-ins at lunch counters were pursuing freedom in the tradition of slave revolts. Three years later, at the beginning of his I Have a Dream speech in Washington, he noted that the current year, 1963, was the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. But he immediately followed by saying, 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. And he listed segregation and police brutality among the reasons why. Three more years later, in 1966, CBS News reporter Mike Wallace asked King the following question. Senator Jacob Javits said that he was a slum resident, but he and some of his fellow Jews were able to make it out of the ghetto on the Lower East Side. The same thing is true with lots of Irish, Italians, and he asked the question why the Negro finds it so difficult to make his way up out of the ghetto. You did. Dr. King responded, number one, 
no other racial group has been a slave on American soil. It's nice to say that other people were down and got up. They were not slaves on American soil. The other thing is that the Negro has had high visibility. And because of the prejudices existing in this country, his color has been against him. And they've used this to keep him from moving up. So if we are to truly be like Dr. King, we must be aware that systemic skin color inequity does indeed exist. And we must be aware that slavery is at the root of the inequity, plaguing African Americans in particular. It is easy for us as Minnesotans not to be aware of these things because slavery's absence in books about Minnesota's history has conditioned Minnesotans to consider slavery and its history irrelevant to the state. In my remarks tonight, I intend to make us aware of slavery's existence in Minnesota and some ways that it has impacted our state. For Dr. King, slavery was not a mere academic, abstract talking point. It was personal because as an African-American, he was a descendant of enslaved people. For example, an enslaver had forced King's paternal great-grandfather to be a breeder with enslaved women. This great-grandfather, a man named Jim Long, was born in 1842, which was not even an entire century before King's own birth in 1929. On April 3, 1968, the night before his assassination, Dr. King said in his last speech, all we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. He said this because the city of Memphis prohibited him from marching there in support of local sanitation workers. He claimed that the injunction went against his freedom of speech and freedom of assembly as provided by the Constitution of the United States. However, this theme, be true to what he said on paper, appears in speeches throughout his tenure as a public speaker. In Washington in 1963, he said that America's treatment of African Americans turned the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution into bad checks marked insufficient funds. Four years later, he contrasted the Declaration's promises of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with the reality of poverty. He said, if a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty, nor the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. Dr. King's passage, be true to what you said on paper, may also very well apply to Minnesota's history of slavery, because if America had only been true to what it said on paper, slavery may not have existed in this state. By 1820, two federal laws banned slavery on the land that eventually became Minnesota territory and then the state of Minnesota. The first law, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, authorized the United States to acquire land in North America from Britain. The United States dubbed this land Northwest Territory and its land is now the state's Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the part of Minnesota lying east of the Mississippi River. But there was a stipulation to that purchase in Article 6 of the Ordinance, which says, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory. The second law, the Missouri Compromise of 1820, set a boundary line for all U.S. territories lying west of the Mississippi River. All land below the 3630 geographic parallel was reserved for future slave states, but above the parallel, there could only be free states. Minnesota's land west of the Mississippi River lies well above that parallel. Consequently, the new law banned slavery in the parts of Minnesota that the Northwest Ordinance did not cover. In 
However, starting in the 1820s, the United States failed to be true to what it said on paper in both those laws. The US Army sent military officers from slave states and free states to a new fort in the free Northwest, Fort Snelling. As an incentive to military officers coming from the much warmer slave states, the army allowed each officer to bring one of his enslaved people to the fort and keep that person enslaved there. The army even paid a stipend to cover the cost of the officer's care of the enslaved person in that free territory. In addition to the enslaved person staying enslaved after crossing into free territory, the army allowed the military officer to bring his captive back home with him to his slave state when the deployment at Fort Snelling ended. The army's deliberate disregard for the two federal anti-slavery laws on paper lasted for four decades. The disregard did not go without challenges from the enslaved. Multiple captives who were taken to forts in the free Northwest, but then to the slave state of Missouri, sued for their freedom. They sued because they knew that the federal laws had promised them freedom in the Northwest, and they wanted the country to be true to what it said on paper. In the 1830s, two women, Rachel and Courtney, sued in Missouri after having spent time at Fort Snelling, and they both won their cases. They provided the legal precedence for Dred Scott and Harriet Scott to sue for their freedom years later. Meanwhile, U.S. presidents also undermined the ban on slavery. Presidents have typically chosen people of similar political views to hold federal offices, and the last two presidents of the antebellum era were no exception. Both Franklin Pierce and his successor, James Buchanan, were from free states, and they held no one in captivity. On the other hand, they fully supported slaveholders' legal right to enslave in slave states, and both presidents supported the extension of that right into all federal territories, such as Minnesota territory. Consequently, both presidents appointed enslavers to federal assignments in free Minnesota, putting the federal anti-slavery laws farther on a path towards becoming obsolete. The counties Benton, Ottertail, Stearns, and Washington had enslavers working as land registers and receivers of public monies. These appointments by the White House profoundly affected the communities to which the appointees were assigned. And slaver George Clitheroe of Alabama became the land register of Ottertail County. While in Minnesota, he invested heavily in land in Scott County, and the people of Minnesota named Lake Clitheroe and the town Clitheroe in his honor. In Stearns County, enslaver Samuel Hayes of Virginia served as the receiver of public monies, and he won praise for establishing a mill in the county. He was a former congressman, and his clout enabled him to develop the county's Democratic Party. As a result, central Minnesota became a strong pro-slavery part of the state. Another founder of the local party, William Carruthers of Tennessee, was the county land register, whose slaveholding uncle had bought thousands of dollars of land in Stearns and Benton counties. Some presidential appointments had statewide ramifications. Under President Franklin Pierce in the mid-1850s, an enslaver from Virginia named Joseph Travis Rosser served as the territorial secretary, or what we now call the lieutenant governor. When Minnesota was a territory, Minnesotans could not elect their own governor and second in command. The president appointed them both. And for Pierce to choose a slaveholder to be one heartbeat away from leading a free territory shows his disregard for federal anti-slavery law concerning Minnesota. Indeed, on the occasions that the governor traveled out of Minnesota, the enslaver Rosser 
became the temporary executive leader of Free Minnesota. Such a predicament shows how untrue the federal government actually was to what it said on paper in the Northwest Ordinance and the Missouri Compromise. When Dr. King marched for open housing in Chicago in 1966, he encountered intense violent resistance from local people that surpassed the responses that segregationists had given in demonstrations throughout the South. Chicagoans were invested in their homes, in their exclusive neighborhoods, and they believed the realtors lies that African-American neighbors drove down property values. As a result, Chicagoans were invested in maintaining residential segregation, and they did not want their neighborhoods desegregated and subsequently devalued without a fight. King lamented about these Northerners. I have never in my life seen such hate, not in Mississippi or Alabama. This is a terrible thing. Similarly, over a century earlier, Northerners in Minnesota were invested in slavery. Many local political figures had become wealthy years earlier by working at trading posts for American Fur Company. The company had posts all over Minnesota, but American Fur Company was owned and operated by slaveholders based in the slave state of Missouri. Pierre Choteau, John Sarpy, and John Sanford ran the company from St. Louis, and they employed and paid some of our most famous Minnesotans, Henry Sibley, Henry Rice, John Prince, Sylvanus Lowry. In turn, those Minnesotans spent that money from slave plantations on the development of communities in Minnesota. Henry Sibley poured his money into building the town of Mendota, and he served as governor of free Minnesota while still on the payroll of American furs and slavers. John Prince co-founded the town of Princeton, Minnesota, and he served as the mayor of the free city of St. Paul while he was still employed by American furs slaveholders. And then there's Sylvanus Lowry. He co-founded St. Cloud by purchasing the land comprising the northern one-third of the city. St. Cloud Hospital and Hester Park sit on this land today. In 1856, Lowry became St. Cloud's first mayor. He directed some of his money from enslavers towards the construction of warehouses in which local people could house their businesses. He also established a ferry business, allowing people to cross the Mississippi River as needed. These employees of American Fur learned from the job that enslavers were wealthy and that they would spend their wealth in the North. So after these Minnesotans bought land with money from slavery, they recruited slaveholders to come to Minnesota to buy land from them. The enslavers usually sailed up the Mississippi River in the spring and summer to come to Minnesota for the purchases tourist markets developed in communities by the river, and hotel keepers encouraged slaveholders to bring one or two enslaved people with them and stay in Minnesota for the summer while buying land. Henry Rice served in Congress, and he asked slaveholding colleagues to buy real estate in Minnesota. His colleague, William Aiken of South Carolina, who enslaved over 700 people loaned $15,000 to the University of Minnesota while on a visit to Minnesota in 1856. What did it mean for one person to enslave 700 others? No more than 20 of Aiken's enslaved people worked at Aiken's mansion in urban Charleston, South Carolina, and they lived in the detached slave quarters by the mansion. The rest of Aiken's unfree laborers lived and worked on his plantation, Jehosi, an island on a river near Charleston. They raised animals and grew corn, rice, and sweet potatoes. 
Their labor enabled Aiken to make $50,000 a year in sales of rice alone. Because his captives made so much money for him, he could afford to loan $15,000 of that money to the University of Minnesota. Years after leaving American Fur, Sylvanus Lowry made $12,000 in sales of his land to enslavers he had invited from his father's home state of Tennessee in 1856, while he was mayor of St. Cloud. As mayor, he led the city's executive branch, which meant that he was responsible for enforcing anti-slavery law in that city. But his undermining of that law by bringing money from slave labor into the city economy showed how untrue he was to what the country said on paper. The US Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision of March 1857 made slavery legal in Minnesota and local tourism by enslavers boomed that summer. Slavery became illegal again in Minnesota in May 1858 when it became a free state. But Minnesotans who had benefited from Minnesota's 14 months of legal slavery defiantly encouraged slaveholders to keep bringing enslaved people with them for the summer. The slaveholders did just that, and none were ever criminally charged with violating the state's anti-slavery law. In 1860, proposals in the Minnesota House and the Minnesota Senate even tried to make slavery legal just for the seasonal tourists from slave states. Both the bill in the Minnesota House and the bill in the Minnesota Senate failed, but they did not fail unanimously. Dr. King's reference to his children and the content of their character was a rhetorical tool that gave flesh and blood to his call for segregation and its violent enforcement to end. By showing how his children suffered because of Jim Crow, he was able to humanize the issue in his 1963 speech in Washington, D.C. By humanizing the issue, his listeners could understand segregation not as an abstract issue, but rather as a genuine problem affecting real people. He was not the first person to refer to his own family when discussing Jim Crow. When the son of activist W.E.B. Du Bois died as a baby, Du Bois eloquently comforted himself in his 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk by saying that at least the boy did not have to grow up to suffer segregation. Du Bois wrote, my soul whispers ever to me saying, not dead, not dead, but escaped, not bond, but free. He said, well sped my boy, before the world had dubbed your ambition insolence, had held your ideals unattainable and talked you to cringe and bow. Therefore, King continued a long activist tradition of making segregation a personal and human matter. Similarly, slavery existed in Minnesota because the enslavers and the Minnesotans failed to acknowledge the humanity of enslaved people. Minnesotans failed to consider the suffering of the African Americans whose labor helped fund Minnesota's development. The money that and slavers paid to Minnesotans came from slave auctions that tore families apart. The money came from whippings and other forms of torture that violently forced greater productivity and therefore greater profits from the enslaved. Consider the enslavers and the enslaved of the Garrig family plantation of East Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On that plantation, a newborn baby boy named Philip Gehrig laid eyes on a boy who had just arrived from overseas. The new arrival was one of millions who survived the months long middle passage from the African continent across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas. Little Philip's parents failed to see the humanity 
of that African boy. Instead, they purchased the African boy and enslaved him, therefore making him a potential heirloom for the junior Garrick. Indeed, little Philip eventually grew into adulthood, but in his senior years, he decided to leave behind life on the Louisiana plantation and follow one of his sons to Minnesota. At the time, in February 1857, Minnesota was a free territory. So leaving Louisiana meant giving up his enslaved people. He could have freed them in a free state or territory, or he could have freed them in Louisiana and immediately sent them to Africa. But either choice meant missing the opportunity to make money from them by selling them. So, as he prepared to leave for Minnesota, he auctioned all of his enslaved people in Louisiana. The newspaper advertisement for the sale said the following, I will sell at public auction in the town of Baton Rouge at the courthouse door on the 14th day of February next at 11 o'clock a.m. a likely lot of Creole slaves as follows five women, two men, and five children. That auction destroyed the families and social networks among the enslaved, but it gave Philip Gehrig thousands of dollars to spend in Minnesota. After he and his family arrived in Minnesota, they primarily spent the profits from those human sales on real estate in Scott County in the city of Shakopee. Also, that image of the auction taking place at a courthouse provides a perfect illustration of how American law protected the business of slavery. Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but that it bends towards justice. But on that day in Baton Rouge in 1857, the arc had not quite bent towards that house of justice holding the sale of human beings. Indeed, the selling of enslaved people at the door of that house of justice shows how distant the ark and justice itself were from that slave auction. The people on sale probably felt the very long length of the ark that day as they heard the auctioneer's ramblings, the shoutings of the bidders, and the wailings of family members being torn away from one another. Also about the humanity of the enslaved, let us consider the captives of Minnesota tourism. When a select few enslaved people were chosen to accompany their enslavers to Minnesota for the enslavers vacations, those captives had to leave behind their families and friends for months. Legally speaking, they became free when they entered the free state of Minnesota but no one in Minnesota reached out to them to help them leave their enslavers or to help them receive their free papers. There were no community resources to help them start their new lives in freedom. And again, all of their loved ones were hundreds of miles away in the South. So when the enslavers returned home from their Minnesota vacation, their formerly enslaved traveling companions became legally re-enslaved by sailing back to the South with them, however reluctantly. This was certainly the case with Mary Butler and her son, John Butler, the namesakes of Butler Park in St. Cloud. When Sylvanus Lowry's sister and brother-in-law chose their pregnant captive, Mary Butler, to accompany them to St. Cloud, in the spring of 1857, Mary Butler had to leave behind her enslaved community in Tennessee. Her family network in Tennessee included an elder woman named Cherry and two younger sister figures, Elizabeth and Lucinda. In the first 30 years after Butler's birth in 1825, she transferred with her parents to multiple members of the family of Lowry's brother-in-law. Thomas Calhoun. 
when Calhoun's father died in 1855, his estate transferred Butler to the junior Calhoun, but Butler's parents went elsewhere. She had only been adjusting to life without her parents for two years before having to leave her new social network, her hometown, her home state, and her home region to go with Calhoun to St. Cloud, Minnesota. The Dred Scott decision allowed Calhoun to bring Butler to St. Cloud enslaved and to keep her enslaved in town because St. Cloud was in Minnesota territory. And as a territory, Minnesota legally permitted slavery. In addition, she could not reach out to the other enslaved people in town. She stayed with Calhoun in Lowry's house, but the only other African-Americans in town were cooped up in hotel rooms with their enslavers. She was isolated from her family back home and from her fellow local captives in St. Cloud. She was alone, but not for long. Weeks after her arrival in St. Cloud, Butler gave birth to her son, John. Minnesota was still a territory then, and slavery was still legal there under the Dred Scott decision. In addition, a mother's legal status determined the legal status of any child she birthed. Unfortunately, Mary Butler's legal enslavement in Minnesota meant that her newborn Minnesota baby, John, was born in Minnesota legally enslaved. For all the joy that John's birth gave to his mother, she desperately wanted to be free. Minnesota's entry into the Union as a free state in May 1858, after 14 months of legal slavery, provided the possibility of freedom for her and her son. However, Calhoun failed to acknowledge the humanity of the mother and son. In them, he only saw monetary value. Freeing them would have left Calhoun with a loss of hundreds of dollars in human possessions. But selling them allowed him to at least receive those hundreds in exchange for the humans. He could not legally sell them in Minnesota, but he had the legal right to take them to a slave state and sell them under the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 because he did not willingly take them to a free state. Instead, he had brought them to a slave territory that suddenly became a free state. So he took the mother and the newborn Minnesotan to a slave state, he sold them there, and then he returned to St. Cloud without them. When Dr. King spoke out against police brutality in 1963 in Washington, he used that very phrase. He said, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Even in 1963, he was speaking of a problem as old as the country itself. The history of police brutality applies to the connection of slavery to Minnesota. Many police forces across the country began as slave patrols, groups of vigilant armed guards on plantations and farms, on the lookout for runaway enslaved people. During the year-long period that slavery was legal in Minnesota territory, anyone in law enforcement had to protect an enslaver's right to enslave within our borders. In the summer of that year, an enslaved person ran away from St. Cloud's Hotel, the Stearns House, with the help of anti-slavery locals, but Law enforcement fought with the locals and returned the fugitive to his enslaver. Finally, in August 1860, two years after Minnesota became a free state, a district court in Minneapolis freed one enslaved woman because she petitioned the court for her emancipation. She happened to be an enslaved person who had been isolated from her enslaved community back in Mississippi, and she had no family there. As a result, 
she had nothing to lose by breaking from her enslavers while in the free state of Minnesota and pushing for the judicial confirmation of the freedom that the laws of free Minnesota promised to her. The judge's granting of her request marked a rare occasion in which Minnesota law was true to what it said on paper for the benefit of an African-American. However, some Minnesotans were angered by the court's verdict of emancipation and they rioted in the city that evening. The visiting Southern slaveholders didn't riot in Minneapolis, Minnesotans did. They targeted the homes of specific people, people who had helped bring the woman to court to emancipate herself. And the police in Minneapolis made no arrests that night, instead simply allowing the rioters to calm down and go back home. Perhaps the same hate King saw in Chicago in 1966 was present among the rioting Minnesotans in 1860. After all, people in Minneapolis saw the woman's emancipation as a threat to their lucrative tourism industry because it threatened to drive away slaveholders who worried that Minnesota courts would free their enslaved people too. Minnesotans did not want to lose money from a rightful emancipation any more than Chicagoans wanted to lose money by conceding that African Americans were free to pursue happiness by living wherever they wanted to live. Something else was at play regarding the anti-emancipation riot. The verdict not only threatened local tourism, but shattered a way of life that Minnesotans had been able to take for granted ever since the construction of Fort Snelling four decades earlier. They had never had to seriously think about the point of view of the enslaved people within their state. Minnesotans were accustomed to enslave people as a temporary presence, coming with a slaveholder for a years long federal appointment or a weeks long vacation. And during that temporary period, Minnesotans saw that the enslavers controlled the minutia of the lives of the enslaved. And Minnesotans saw that the enslavers paid little mind to the feelings of their captives. The people of Minneapolis were accustomed to just stepping back, taking the enslavers money while letting them treat their captives any way they wanted. Just like segregationists had taken for granted the submissiveness they thought African-Americans would willingly continue forever under segregation. And just like Chicagoans thought that African-Americans would always stay out of neighborhoods where they were not wanted. At each point, when African-Americans like that enslaved woman in Minneapolis, or like Dr. King, challenged the expectation of submissiveness and voicelessness and demanded to be heard and to be afforded the protection of the law, their opponents rioted. The Civil War began in April 1861, just eight months after the anti-emancipation riots. As the Union fought against the Confederacy over slavery, Minnesotans still could not agree among themselves on slavery. At least one central Minnesotan was still invested in publicly sympathizing with enslavers. At the time, the only daily newspaper in St. Cloud was the abolitionist Democrat, which constantly called for slavery in the United States to end. But Sylvanus Lowry started the Union newspaper in order to cater to local people who thought that the country was too tough on slaveholders. To him and his readers, the Confederate states were wrong to secede instead of physically leaving the country, but the abolitionists were much worse for driving the Confederates to secession in the first place. Lowry edited the newspaper for only one year, but the paper survives today as the St. Cloud Times. Ironically enough, Lowry had initially, but unintentionally, supported his competition. The abolitionist editor 
Jane Gray Swisshelm had come from Pennsylvania to Minnesota in 1857, and she desired to start a newspaper. She asked Lowry for financial assistance, and he agreed, but only if she would not denounce slavery. She promised not to do so, and she took his money. But her first newspaper, The Visitor, criticized slavery from the start. While historians have properly congratulated her for outsmarting the local pro-slavery land baron, the fact remains that her newspaper was funded in part by his money, much of which had come directly from enslavers engaged in the very practice she sought to have eradicated. For the state's best known anti-slavery newspaper to be funded by slaveholders, shows just how foundational money from slavery had become to the economy of free Minnesota. This development shows what can happen when America is not true to what it says on paper. Like the St. Cloud Times, the University of Minnesota also survives today, in part because Minnesotans continued to embrace money from enslavers through the Civil War. The war's eruption made university donor William Aiken the resident of an enemy land, the Confederate state of South Carolina. Minnesotans worried about the ethics of owing money to a resident of an enemy land. So lawmakers passed the Rebellion Act of 1862. That law prohibited Confederate residents from suing in Minnesota's courts. Aiken, consequently, had no legal means to receive the $8,000 that the university still owed him. So, the University of Minnesota kept that money from slave labor for itself, and it never fully repaid his loan. When the university stopped acknowledging its debt to the enslaver, it stopped acknowledging its debt to the enslaved people whose labor had made the loan possible. By seeing enslaved African Americans primarily as a means to make money, slaveholders, Minnesotans, and the federal government kept America from being true to what it said on paper. But the 13th Amendment ended legal slavery in this country in 1865. And Dr. King has been dead since 1968. Does the fierce urgency of now, of which he spoke, still exist 54 years after his death? And what about his frequent references to slavery? Winsome Sears, the current Lieutenant Governor of Virginia recently said, slavery happened, absolutely, and there are some vestiges of it. But how long are we going to go back there? Unfortunately, the poverty and police brutality of which Dr. King spoke in the 1950s and 1960s still exists today in 2022. And during his lifetime, he did not flinch from tying both problems to the country's history of slavery. He found it necessary to go back there as Sears put it, as long as those vestiges of poverty and police brutality persisted. So we must do the same. We must go back there because those vestiges persist today. And as Minnesotans, we have specific tasks to perform. To keep King's legacy of awareness of slavery alive, we Minnesotans must, meet, must realize that when King said, no other racial group has been a slave on American soil. That includes Minnesota soil. To address the wealth gap, as King tried to do, is to not only acknowledge Minnesota's chasm of wealth across the color line, but also to identify slavery as part of the story of Minnesota's wealth inequity. Colorblindness will not heal our country, but the following things will. Our acknowledgement of the country's history of inequality and its vestiges, our remorse for that history and its vestiges, 
and our actions to undo those vestiges. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Lehman, uh, so much for that. And if we were in person right now, I know that, that people would be on their feet um, applauding. <laughs> um, that was just, was just really wonderful. Um, we're now thank going you. to, to uh, transition to uh, the question and answer portion. So for audience members and attendants uh, online, um, if you look on the bottom of your screen, you should see a little box that says Q&A. Um, so go ahead and, and use this time to, to enter your questions. Um, and we'll do our best to make sure we we get to some of them. But I just, you know, I have to ask since you've you've published Sla Slavery's Reach, um, you know, what's been the reaction to your book in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Well, overall, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, the few critiques I've received have just been about how perhaps slavery wasn't as important to Minnesota as I thought it was or that I was arguing that it was. But those people didn't necessarily have their own research to say why it wasn't as important. Whereas I concluded that all those deeds and probate court documents I had found um, provide more than enough proof. Now, it is true that some communities were more reliant on money from slavery than others. but what I tell people is that if slavery wasn't a big deal in Minnesota, why would Minnesota pass a law just to keep money from William Aiken? And why would, why would Minnesota try to become a slave state two years after becoming a free state if it wasn't a big deal? Now, among people who love the book, what I heard quite a bit was that it made them sad to read it. And I didn't give them a hero to root for. And I mean, in a way that's good because if you come away from slavery's reach thinking, this is a good thing that happened, then, well, I don't know what to tell you. But um, yeah, but if it made people feel sad, then it's good that reading the story of slavery in Minnesota was a sad story for them because it was certainly a sad story for me, but I felt it was a necessary story because it's part of who we are as Minnesotans, it's part of who we are as Americans. And if you don't get that part, then you don't get the full story. Well, and, and I think it's just the way, the way you said that was so good. Um, you know, I, I, we're, we're here, we're celebrating um, Dr. King and his, his life, his legacy, um, you know, here at St. Ben's, obviously for the week, but also, you know, nationally on Monday, um, you know, as a, as a scholar of African-American history and, and culture, you know, and, and as a fellow Black man, uh, you know, what does Dr. King and his legacy mean to you? Well, it means that the tools that he used and the things that he stood for, the things that he um, worked so hard to try to get rid of are still with us. I mean, legally speaking, segregation is dead, but it had lasted for decades and then segregation had lasted for generations before that. And if you, if you have 1619 as your starting point for the history of injustice against African-Americans, well, even if you go back to 1565, because Spain first brought Africans to Florida in 1565, and Britain didn't bring their Africans to Virginia until half a century later. But if you go from 1565 to 1865, that's 300 years of legal slavery on this land. And then another century after that was legal segregation. And so that's 400 years we're talking about. And you can't undo 400 years of the hurt and inequity that comes from those things in only 60 years. 
it's impossible. So yes, we still have police brutality and we still have poverty. And just as Dr. King traced those to slavery, we have to do the same thing. We have to say slavery is the reason why there are haves and there are have nots. We have to be free to say that. We have to be open in saying that. And by saying that, especially as a country, then we can have more progress towards getting rid of those things. Yeah, and you know, and I wanna, I wanna hammer down on that point of the freedom to say that because you know you're uh, originally from Oklahoma, and and Oklahoma is a state um, like several others that have have recently passed these anti-critical race theory or anti-CRT laws um, that have led to the banning of writings from uh, prominent African Americans, other writers of color, um, you know, notably Nicole Hannah Jones and the 1619 Project, um, but others as well, and and so. I'm curious, you know, like, what do you think when you see these types of laws? Well, I'm discouraged by them. Um, fortunately, a lot of them are not really that easy to enforce because they have to do with feelings. I mean, if you look at the Oklahoma law, for example, it bans the teaching of things that would cause children to feel badly because of who they are. And speaking as a teacher who talks about injustice and other harmful things that have happened to people of color, I don't say in my lectures, white people should feel bad for what happened or it's white people's fault or it's your fault as a white person that this happened. That's not my job. My job is just to say what happened, to say how people were hurt by what happened, if they were, and to show how the hurt and how the inequality has just been allowed to um, accumulate and grow out of control. Now, all those things are facts. And, and there's a way to teach those facts and not say, everybody should feel guilty for being white because this happened. I mean, that, that's, that, that's just not how teaching works. And, and it's really, really distressing because, you know, one thing that I would hear a lot from students in my career when I would teach these things is something like, well, my grandparents feel this way but they're old and they're gonna die soon. So this kind of thinking is gonna die. The governor of Oklahoma is a few months older than I am. And we both started Oklahoma State University in 1991. I graduated in 95, he graduated in 96. We never met each other, but to think that we're part of the same generation and approximately the same age and to, approach critical race theory two radically different ways. It's, um, it's unsettling. It is, it is, um, it is. And, and difficult, as you said, you know, um, to, to enforce on feelings. I mean, um, you could certainly imagine um, in your younger days or, or other children of color reading the exact same book and having feelings about it as well. It's distressing. Um, how can it not be? Um, so one of the things, and, and you, you kind of alluded to this in your, your just the previous answer here, um, one of the things that stood out for me in your book was really the, the white collar nature of part, that part of the slavery industry. Um, you know, you have a chapter that's about, you know, bankers and insurance agents and, and, um, and obviously real estate. Um, so, and, and what, what stood out was just that economic exploitation that allowed the slaveholder wealth to drive entire industries, you know, far beyond the, the plantations themselves and where slavery was actually taking place. Um, so, so knowing that economic justice was a central pillar for Dr. King, um, you know, I'm curious if you see any parallels from the economic exploitation that was going on at that time and economic exploitation that's happening today. Absolutely. And I mean, the major difference between the exploitation in the South and the exploitation in Minnesota 
is that um, African Americans were exploited for their labor where they worked in the South, but African Americans were exploited in Minnesota because the labor that was generated in the South generated the money that the Northerners took. And Minnesotans just took for granted that they didn't have to see the people whose labor they were cashing in on. And whenever they did have to see them, it was only temporary. You know, eventually the military officers would go back to the South. Eventually the people who came to the hotels for the summer would leave in the fall before the Mississippi River froze. So Minnesotans just got used to African-Americans being a temporary people, especially as tourism boomed in Minnesota. Different communities that were nowhere near the fort just got used to seeing African-Americans only from April to September. And then for the rest of the year, they didn't really have to think about them. And in a lot of communities, Minnesota's economy developed on the invisibility of African Americans. You could certainly make a case for that in St. Cloud because the only people who lived here were people who were brought by Lowry's family or they were the people who stayed at the hotels. Once the Civil War started, that cut off the tourism and basically cut off the Confederate South. So there were no more people to come to Minnesota to exploit the lax enforcement of anti-slavery laws. And once the enslavers stopped coming, the African-Americans did too. And there would be African-Americans here and there coming to central Minnesota after the Civil War. But, Minis but St. Cloud, Minnesota has only had consistently an African-American in the city since 1883. We can say St. Cloud has always had African-Americans since 1883. You go back further than that, you can't say that. And so that means that the families who had been in Minnesota for generations, who had been in, in St. Cloud for generations, have that long of a head start of making money and establishing themselves. Whereas African Americans, um, they got here later. And when some of them tried to raise their families here, they were shut out from a lot of the jobs that they had the educational training to, um, to be hired for. St. Cloud never had segregated schools. So black children and white children could learn together, but when it came time for a job and everybody finished high school, African-Americans would be offered um, service work, domestic labor, and it didn't fit their education. So all the kids left, they all went to the Twin Cities or Canada or elsewhere, but they didn't stay. And eventually their parents died. So even though there's been a continuous African-American presence since 1883, um, the families have just always died out. The oldest African-American family in St. Cloud, meaning the family with the longest continuous presence is the McRae family. And they moved here in 1959. So that's a whole century after the first people came to St. Cloud to start families, having come from Germany and um, Scandinavia after that. Well, I want to hammer in on that, uh, the, again, the money and uh, the economics piece. I've got a question from the audience here. It says, you know, what do you believe was the biggest influence in allowing slavery in Minnesota? Was it money, power? Oh. Well, it's a combination of money and Minnesotans just following the example of the federal government. I mean, when, when the US Army made it okay for officers to bring their enslaved people, and then when presidents started sending enslavers to Minnesota, 
Minnesotans just got a sense that this is just something that's supposed to happen here. Now, Minnesotans knew that based on the climate and the kind of soil that's here, having a plantation economy is just not feasible. So Minnesotans never worried about Minnesota becoming a slave state. Even Southerners didn't want Minnesota to be a slave state, but they wanted to have as much economic influence on Minnesota as possible so that when issues of slavery within Minnesota's borders came up, there would still be this tolerance for enslavers to bring one or two enslaved people with them for the summer and not have to free them. That's what they bought when they bought their land here too. And, and sticking with the um, sort of, again, the, the economics and the money, um, another question from the audience is, you know, what types of efforts um, do you see in modern day Minnesota to, to reduce um, the racial gaps, um, be it achievement gaps and economic gaps, um, and more importantly, to create awareness about these deep rooted, rooted gaps um, often hidden by Minnesota's prosperity? Well, honestly, there just hasn't been that much that's been done that has led to progress because Minnesota just has a terrible record of inequity. I mean, we're, we're pretty low nationally when it comes to that. And I think part of the whole out of sight, out of mind mentality that's been allowed to develop is part of that. What I'm hoping is that the more people realize that slavery is at the root of inequity, and that means it's part of the root of Minnesota's inequity, then Minnesotans will embrace that as part of how we got here, as opposed to African-Americans or people of color just not trying hard enough or not looking hard enough for a job and that Minnesota has always been this utopia and this um, super liberal state. I mean, that's, that's just not historically accurate. I mean, sure, we have Hubert Humphrey, but we also have Sylvanus Lowry. And we have Henry Sibley, who again, was governor of a free state while he was still working for slaveholders. So we have to embrace all of that part of our history and not just hide behind the liberal stuff that makes us feel good. Well, and that, that, that complex nature um, is, is something that, that came up also um, in your book, but specifically um, around you know, the Supreme Court and the American legal system. So you know, that comes up repeatedly in your book. Obviously, you mentioned um, you know, the two women who were able to petition their freedom and and, and that's great, right? The courts worked, but then also you have the Dred Scott decision. And so you can see those examples of the legal system being a hindrance to civil rights um, uh, and freedom for African-Americans. So what's your like overall view of the role of the courts and the legal system um, in African-Americans fight for freedom and equality? Well, I've always been a firm believer that the best way to push for justice is to push outside the system. Now, that's not to say that people inside the system are not important, but it's people who are outside the system who can make the greatest impetus because being outsiders, they don't have to be compromised by the system itself. So that's why it was so important for people who were against slavery to um, to do the things that they did to help run away enslaved people, to help enslave fugitives. If it weren't for them being willing to quarter people in their homes and to hold secret meetings where enslaved fugitives could have their say, um, there wouldn't have been any way for those enslaved runaways to become free and eventually make their way to Canada. 
And then once you get to the era of popular media and mass media with television and so forth, it takes the visual image of a mass of people confronting a law that they are willing to break because they think the law is wrong, what we call civil disobedience. It takes that to prick the nation's conscience on segregation. I mean, one of the reasons that the image of marchers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama is so powerful is because it's not staged, it's real. And it's these marchers with no weapons in church clothes or formal attire, just marching because they want the right to vote. And then this wall of police on horseback charging at them, um, holding clubs and beating them. Now, that's not TV that people are used to seeing in 1965. And when the news networks get a hold of it, they immediately cut from whatever they're broadcasting and they show that footage. ABC at the time was showing the movie Judgment at Nuremberg, which is about the, the trial for Nazi war criminals. They cut away from that to show bloody Selma. So it was that footage that pricked the conscience that led the government to make the changes that it did. But governments are not altruistic. They don't do stuff out of the goodness of their hearts. They do stuff differently when the stuff that they have been doing becomes a liability. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you, you brought up the, the people sort of working outside the system, because one of the observations um, in our reading group was that, you know, there, there, are, have, there were always people opposed. Yes. There was always people doing something to undermine slavery. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the journalist who takes the slave mm -hmm. money to create the, the, um, the newspaper and then publishes anti-slavery articles. So there's always these people on the outside um, sort of pushing and undermining the system. And I'm, I'm curious, what are some, some ways today? Um, because that also hearkens us, I think, to one of the challenges that Dr. King brought up with, you know, the, the sort of idea of the white moderate, right? More committed to to tranquility and peace than to justice. And so what are some ways do you think of today in our context where people can, can work outside of the system to continue to push for freedom and justice? Mm -hmm. um, well, you, there are still marches. You, that's still a powerful tool. Um, I'm not that good of a community organizer. What I tend to do on an individual level is write letters I write letters to my representatives. If I hear about something happening at a place of business that I think needs to be changed, then I'll write to that business. And you know, sometimes the businesses respond the way I'd like them to. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they ignore my letters. But at least I'm making the effort of putting my voice out there and saying, this is something that I think needs to change. And, and you never know just how powerful that can be or how much, how effective that can be. For example, when my youngest son was in the Scouts and I had to go to the Scout store in Sartell to buy something, I saw that one of the items for sale was a joke book. And I flipped through the joke book and there are all these jokes that were ethnic stereotypes about Native Americans and maybe Asian Americans too, but definitely Native Americans. So I, um, I went to the, the clerk at the desk and mentioned that this book is part of the inventory and asked you know, who can I talk to about that. And she gave me an email of someone to reach. And so I wrote to that person to say, you know, I know that the scouts are big on diversity now. This book 
challenges that. Um, what are you going to do about it? And within a week or two, the book was pulled from the store, and the Boy Scouts have a website where merchandise is sold. And that book used to be on the website, but within the week it was taken off the national website too. So I say all that to say that, you know, just write the letter, you know, just have the march or just put a petition on change.org and, and just see what happens. I mean, you, you get zero or rather you get 100%, you don't get a hundred, what's the phrase? You, you get 0% of the change that you don't ask for. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that, um, that, that, that makes me think of, of a, a line that you used, um, that, that Dr. King used, um, you know, uh, be true to what you said on paper. And I think, yes. um, especially since the murder of George Floyd, uh, many institutions, um, colleges, universities, businesses, governments have made lots of statements um, about diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in those efforts. And, and I'm curious, you know, um, as you look around, do you, do you see um, institutions who are putting out these statements, do you see them being true to what they said on paper? Do you see that as something that, that is happening? Well, if you had asked me before the spring of 2021, I probably would have said yes. Uh, there seems to be quite a bit of backpedaling now. And that typically happens whenever there's a moment, like when Floyd was murdered, or when Trayvon Martin was murdered. I'm old enough to remember when Rodney King was beaten and that video went, the 1991 version of viral. Um, I mean, th there are these moments that happen and then they pass. And sometimes you get back to the way things were. And then sometimes you have what we have now where it seems that things are getting worse. I, mean, I didn't ever think that voting rights would be threatened to the degree that it is now. I always knew that it was something that we had to be vigilant about. But once the voting rights was gutted by the Supreme Court back in 2013, I thought this cannot be good. And you know, here we are eight years later, and this is after George Floyd, that all these states are doing these measures to not have all votes matter. Um, now on the plus side, it is good that an awareness of our history is, is a bit more widespread. Now, it has caused two different reactions. There are people who are aware of the history and they want us to keep being aware of it. And then there are others who are aware of the history and want it put back underground as quickly as possible. And it's getting to the point where we can't even agree on what is truth and what is fact. Um, oh, one of the people who didn't like my book, um, I had talked about slavery existing in Minnesota on face, not on, on Twitter, and there was a person who accused me of coming into her state and just saying a bunch of stuff that's not true, even though I'd already been in Minnesota for 19 years by then. I mean, that's a pretty long game to come to Minnesota and wait 19 years just to write slavery speech, but, but I digress. Um, and she said I was coming into her state and messing things up. And I said that the things in my book come from going to multiple libraries and archives and finding the paper trail. And I'll never forget, she said, archives have a liberal bias what are you going to do with that? How, how can you argue with that? So, uh, I mean, I love having debates. I love having arguments and hearing different sides of things, but they have to be grounded in fact. They have to be grounded by reason or else you just can't have a dialogue. 
Well, and 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 shout out to uh, to librarians um, and archivists all over, um, and and here at St. Ben's and St. John's as well, the keepers of of history and uh, and of those facts, so that you know uh, the historical society without that, you know, slavery's reach is not able to be written. So right. Um, um, so along that point, though, you know, how do we confront those who say, you know, slavery happened a long time ago, um, when really it, it actually hasn't been that long? Right. Um, well, you have to make it personal and you have to tie it as much to the present as possible. Now, one of the things that I have done on my Facebook account is, well, once I posted an obituary for someone who died in November 1973, she was 111 years old when she died. So she was born in late 1861, and she was born enslaved. So for her to be this former enslaved person who lived during the first month of my life after birth means that I shared the planet with a former slave. And I'm only 48. So when I, when I bring those kinds of things to people's attention, then that helps them to see that this is all very recent stuff. And as far as making it geographically relevant, that helps when people want to pivot and say, well, slavery happened all over the world. Why just talk about America when it was everywhere? When I point out the different little hometowns and counties and the bigger hometowns and counties, neighborhoods, places where I know students of mine are from, I can see the expressions on their faces when it hits home for them, literally, when they say, oh, that's where I live. And all of a sudden they're not thinking about the rest of the world anymore. They're thinking, this is part of my community. And the more you make things relevant like that, the more of a connection that people will have. It's, it's hard to pivot to the rest of the world when something is about you, sad to say. Well, um, and I've got uh, some folks here and, I, and I'm, I'm interested in this as well, but how did you get started in digging into this? Like, um, you know, what, what, what inspired you to, to write this book or to, to pursue um, this history? Mm -hmm. Well, ever since I moved here 20 years ago, I'd been interested in the local history, especially within my first year here, I learned about there being enslaved people who were brought to St. Cloud. I'd never heard that. And having done family tree research, I knew that going to census records was a good way to do research on the history of enslaved people. So what I had done for the first decade I was here was to see if I could find people who were listed in the Minnesota census as being Minnesota residents who had been born in the South and somehow came here later. And then I would go to earlier censuses from the Southern states to see if any of those Southerners were enslaved people or enslavers. And so I did that for a decade. And then one day I found someone who was listed in two different states in the same year census. It was Harwood Eigelhart, the namesake of Eigelhart Avenue in St. Paul. But in the 1860 census, Eigelhart was listed as a resident of St. Paul, Minnesota. But in the slave census or the slave schedule, he was listed as an enslaver in Maryland. And that's because I think his father was keeping his enslaved woman there while Harwood was in St. Paul. But that woman was still enslaved in Harwood's name in Maryland. And then I found out that Eigelhart sold real estate in Minnesota. So I got to thinking, well, how many other people from the South came to Minnesota and bought land? And 
I started going to county record offices because they hold the deeds. And I would go to all the deeds from before 1865, since 1865 is when slavery ended. So that meant that if there were any Southerners in the deeds before 1865 as buyers or sellers of land, then those Southerners could have been slaveholders. So I would write down the names of the Southerners and where they lived or where they were from rather. And then I would go home and I would look them up on databases that had slave censuses. And if the people in those deeds were listed as slaveholders in the slave census, then I knew that the deed was the document that showed that money exchanged hands from that slaveholder to the Minnesotan. I mean, it's unquestionable proof that money from a plantation or money from the buying and selling of humans found its way to Minnesota. And my book, Slavery's Reach, is just a collection of all those different things I found in real estate offices throughout Minnesota, but especially along the Mississippi River. And and so, like, after you you committed to the research, I, I've got a question here. You know, have you, ha, do you have any opinions or recommendations for, for reparations for family, families um, directly or indirectly directly, uh, affected by enslavement? Well, I have often said that it's important for people who were involved in the slave trade to know that they were involved. It's important to know where part of their money comes from, and then they can decide what to do with that knowledge. For example, I, I found the information about the U of M using money from slavery to build one of their first campus buildings. And I was asked this same question by people at the U of M. And I told them, well, you know, um, one thing you can do is perhaps offer free tuition to anyone who is a descendant of those 700 people that Aiken enslaved in South Carolina. Another option is to have some kind of monument or memorial placed on the site where the building used to be. It's no longer standing. Um, it's important to acknowledge that as part of the official history of the university as well. There are all sorts of things that the U of M can do. Um, no, same thing goes for St. Cloud Times. Every edition of the paper <clears throat> on the page that has the corporate information says established 1861. Never says by who and never says with money from slavery, but, um, but that's how the paper began. Now, whether the Times ever wants to go out of its way to have a special one page or maybe even a whole issue to talk about that history, that's up to them. But people who read my book know that that connection is there, whether the paper wants to admit it or not. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think I think um, last question for the audience, and, I, and for those questions we weren't able to get to, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, we we tried to do our best, but um, uh, Dr. Layman, do you have any recommendations for other um, Black people wanting to find out about the ans about their ancestry and see how slavery affected their families? Yes, um, the best thing to do is to start with the census of 1870 because that's the first census after 1865. So that's the first census where everybody is free and everybody is listed by name, first and last. If you know people in your family who were alive in 1870, then you can find them there. And once you know the names and where they lived, 
then you can go back 10 years to the last of the slave censuses and see if people who have that same last name are listed as slaveholders in that same area. And if they are, then chances are um, that ancestor is an enslaver or an enslaved person. Now the thing about slave censuses or slave schedules is that <clears throat> they always listed the enslaved people anonymously under the name of the enslaver. So for example, when I found out about one of my ancestors, I had found him in a census from 1870 and he was listed as 50 years old. And his last name was the same as the last name of the European American woman who was his neighbor. So I looked up the slave census from 10 years earlier in 1860, and I saw that woman's name listed. And for the listings of the enslaved people, I saw an anonymous person, but listed as 40 instead of 50, and as male and as black. So that's how I knew that that anonymous person listed was the same person as the ancestor I had found. I mean, it's very detailed detective work, but that's, that's how you start. And then once you're able to find names of enslavers, then you can dig into their families. And if you know those enslavers' parents and that they died before 1865, you can find their wills or you can find their probate inventory. And it's in the court documents that you can actually see people enslaved listed by name. In the census, you can't, but in the court records, you can. It, it does sound like detective work. And I think <laughs> folks who read your book will uh, will be, I think, shocked by the level of detail and, and also the number of names that come up. Um, so one thing I, I slightly lied, I maybe have one more question because sure, I'd, be, sure. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, are you working on anything new? Um, should we expect another book in the near future? Uh, well, hopefully within the next couple of years, the book I'm working on now will come out. Um, it's a response to the people who said I didn't give them anyone to root for. And it's about Eliza Winston, the woman who sued for her freedom in Minnesota and won. She's in, I think, the next to last chapter of the book. And it's the first biography about Eliza Winston. People have written about her because she's sort of this Minnesota folk hero when it comes to slavery. And since um, she was freed months before the Civil War, and that was really the first and only time that that happened, she's probably as big a symbol of slavery in Minnesota as Dred Scott is and his wife, Harriet Scott. So there's not that much information about Eliza Winston herself. There's only one document in which she's giving her testimony. But from that testimony, I've been able to find other documents and other people who had enslaved her. And so I'm, I'm devoting a lot of that book to her life before coming to Minnesota. Like what was her life like while enslaved in Mississippi? And what was her life like while enslaved in Tennessee? Who were all the different people who laid claim to her? And what was it about her life that inspired her to even try to go for her freedom in Minnesota. What I was pleasantly surprised to learn was that Eliza was not this person who just came to Minnesota all confused from the South and the good people of Minnesota had to tell her that she was free. I mean, she knew that she was free. She knew what freedom was. She had actually lived around free people at various points in her life in the South. She just needed help in getting access to it in Minnesota. And my book is about her freedom journey. And again, hopefully it'll come out no later than 2024.
Well, I'm already um, excited for that, and we'll definitely have to have you have you back out to St. Ben's and St. John's, and hopefully in person that time. Um, yes. Hopefully the pandemic's over by then. <laughs> um, I hope so too. <laughs> so once again, I'd, I'd really like to thank our guest today, uh, Dr. Chris Lehman, uh, for a wonderful evening and for sharing this important history with the St. Ben's and St. John's community. Um, it's it's truly been a pleasure, and I've enjoyed this conversation. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to read Slavery's Reach, um, I highly encourage you to take time to read this work. Um, we have some extra copies at the Multicultural Center, just throwing that out there. Um, but we're truly b blessed to have Dr. Lehman um, and his work in our local community. Um, and as we close out this event and this year's MLK Week at St. Ben's and St. John's, I hope we remember the importance of this history and we keep in mind the fierce urgency of now as we push for equality and justice, both at home and abroad. Thank you and have a good evening.